Good morning to you all. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, some results about the Spritz stream cipher. So let's begin. Okay, so as you all know that uh, RC4 has been the most extensively used stream cipher over the past two decades, and it has been part of a uh, number of very, very important internet protocols. Uh, most notable of them is uh, this TLS protocol, which is used in secure browser communication. Uh, now, uh, ever since the source code of RC4 was leaked uh, in some uh, internet forum, that's about uh, 20 to 22 years ago, RC4 has been the subject of intense scrutiny by the crypto community, and a number of researchers have published uh, some results or the other about uh, RC4. Uh, the most uh, prominent of them are uh, this, the very famous second byte bias of RC4 by Manchin and Shamir, uh, which was uh, extended to all the first uh, 256 bytes by Maitre and his group at uh, FSC 2011. Uh, the best known state recovery attack on RC4 is the one by uh, Maximum, uh, Maximov and Kovratovich at Crypto 2008. And very, very, very recently, there have been practical plain text recovery attacks on TLS in both uh, USNIX and uh, FSE conferences of 2013. And as a result, the use of RC4 in internet traffic has decreased significantly. And uh, as of uh, January 2016, uh, both Firefox and Chrome have dropped RC4 from their browsers. Okay, so in the middle of all this, uh, Ron Rivest kind of took it upon himself to design a reasonably good uh, replacement for RC4. And so in the CryptoRAM session of 2014, uh, Rivest and Schultz proposed the design for Spritz. Uh, now, the, the designers did extensive computer experiments, and uh, they are alleged to have searched uh, or performed a search over a million candidate ciphers, and, and they did what turned out to be around uh, five core months worth of CPU computations before arriving at this design. Uh, one good thing about Spritz is that, apart from the basic stream cipher mode of operation, the designers also specify techniques that can be used to achieve the functionalities of, uh, say, a MAC or a hash function, and also uh, authenticated encryption with the associated data. Uh, because the structure of uh, Spritz was slightly complicated, uh, uh, its software speed is significantly less than RC4. But if one is prepared to overlook the speed aspect, it seemed to be a very good replacement, a very good drop-in replacement for RC4. Okay, um, so this is how um, the designers described the modes of operation in Spritz in terms of uh, uh, 13 separate modules, if I'm not mistaken. So to begin with, uh, they have an array S, and they initialize this array S to the identity permutation over Z256. That is uh, the ring of integers modulo 256. And they have, uh, additionally, they have six counters, i, j, k, e, z, and w, uh, which are initialized to either 0 or 1. And after this, uh, the protocol performs a bunch of steps, which I'm sure looks a lot complicated in this slide, but uh, I'll try to simplify this for you. Okay. So in the basic stream cipher mode of operation, uh, it follows three basic steps. Absorb, then an absorb stop, and absorb IV, and then the squeeze. Uh, what the absorb phase does is it absorbs, it kind of absorbs the information present in the secret key and uh, modifies the, the array S used in, uh, used in spritz accordingly. And if, uh, if an IV is required, then the step B may also be performed. In the same way, the, the IV information is absorbed into the state nibble by nibble. If, uh, if, the, if, the, if an IV is not required, then the step B may be simply ignored. Uh, squeeze is the module that is responsible for, uh, responsible for producing uh, the output key stream bytes. So we will be concentrating on, on the squeeze module uh, in the, throughout this uh, presentation. A uh, few points to consider before uh, we proceed. 
Out of the six indices that are used in spritz, the index A plays no role in, uh, in, in the squeeze phase. It is only used uh, during the absorb and the absorb stop phases, and so uh, the index A uh, practically has no role. Uh, the index W is a constant during the squeeze phase, and it depends only on the length of the key or the IV that is used. And if, uh, and if you were to follow the recommendation of the designers and limit the size of the key to n by 4, that is 64 bytes, then the value of the index W is always 7. Okay. And another important thing to consider is that uh, the value of the index i going into the squeeze phase is always 0. And this is irrespective of what the length of the key or the IV is. Okay. So more precisely, let me summarize the exact sequence of steps that is uh, followed in the squeeze phase. And in this slide, I'm comparing it with the corresponding uh, uh, set of steps in RC4. As we can see, the uh, spritz performs one extra step. That is because it has to update the index k. And apart from this, the update of the, of the, of the index j is slightly more complicated than RC4. And so is the expression for the output byte, output keystream byte z. Uh, another uh, striking difference between RC4 and uh, spritz is the fact that there is explicit dependence of the, of the current keystream byte z with the previous keystream byte, which is kind of absent in uh, RC4. Okay. Okay, so now we come to the main uh, theorem of uh, the paper, of well, one of the main theorems. We claim that the first two output bytes produced by Spritz, uh, we claim that the probability of the first two output bytes produced by Spritz uh, being both equal to negative of W is one over n squared by three, three over, uh, one over n squared plus three over n to the power four. And so this event is slightly biased. Now, how to prove this? Um, so we will outline a set of three mutually exclusive events, one, two, and three. Uh, we will see that, uh, you can see that each of these three events uh, need to satisfy four conditions. And so, so each, uh, the probability of each of these events is roughly one over n to the power four. And we will show that if the initial state uh, going into the squeeze phase satisfies uh, one of these three conditions, then the, output, uh, the, the first two output bytes are kind of guaranteed to be equal to negative of W. And it's not very difficult to see why. As for example, when, uh, when, the, when the condition one occurs, if you just follow the sequence of steps in the, uh, if, you, if you just follow the sequence of steps in the spritz uh, squeeze um, um, specification, then we can very easily find out that uh, that after the first round, the output uh, byte produced is equal to negative of W. And the routine thing done on the second round will show that the second output byte is also negative of W. Uh, and, and we will get the same, uh, similar results if we analyze events two and three. And so, uh, putting this all together, let us now denote by E the union of the events one, two, and three. So we have that the probability that the event E occurs is roughly 3 over n to the power 4. And we have just proven that uh, the probability that the first two bytes are negative of W, given that the event E occurs is, is equal to 1. Now, if you assume that uh, when E does not occur, the, this probability is more or less uniformly random, then we can, we can use uh, Bayes' theorem to put all this together, and this probability comes to one over n squared plus uh, thrice over n to the power four, as was claimed in the theorem, uh, claimed in the theorem statement. Okay, and so by the one, one over pq square rule, so this kind of uh, bias will take around n, n to the power six over nine, uh, that's around two to the power 45 samples, uh, to distinguish from random. Okay, so we were able to verify the bias for uh, reduced versions of the Spritz cipher uh, for n equal to 16 and 32. Uh, in both cases, we were able to see a significant bias at uh, the values um, pointed to by negative w, comma negative of w. Okay. And now, uh, what we wanted to do was to extend the previous attack 
into a distinguisher for uh, the single key IV key stream, that is um, the case when uh, the key stream is produced by a single key or a single key IV pair. And there are some practical difficulties in doing so. So as it turns out that the, the event the t and the t plus 1 both equal to negative of w, this event is actually not biased for any arbitrary value of t. And the reason is not very difficult to guess. If you, if you analyze the previous proof, you'll find that we need these two initial conditions to hold at the beginning. Uh, we need both i and z to be 0 at the beginning of uh, the start of uh, the squeeze phase. Uh, of, of course, uh, the, uh, this condition, uh, although it holds at the start of the squeeze phase, it might not hold for any arbitrary value of t. But we know that i becomes 0 after every n, n iterations. And so, so at the beginning of a new cycle of n iterations, the value of i is always 0. So we thought it might be more useful to look at this event instead. This is the probability that the first two output bytes of a new cycle is equal to negative of w given that the output byte just before it is 0. And this kind of satisfies all the initial conditions that, uh, that was present in the previous proof. And so this probability also turns out is also actually 1 over n squared plus thrice over n to the power 4. But we also need z of kn to be 0. And this will occur once, again, once every n cycle. So, so in order to distinguish this key stream using this kind of an event, so we will need kind of n times n times n6 over 9 key stream bytes, which turns out to be around 2 to the power 61. OK, we now come to the second part of the paper, which is uh, in which we describe a state recovery attack on spritz. Uh, now, state recovery attack on RC4 was proposed by Maximov and Kovratovich in Crypto 2008. Uh, this basic attack takes around 2 to the power 241 steps. Uh, the state size of Spritz is slightly larger than RC4 on the account of the fact that it uses uh, six additional uh, pseudo-random indices. And so the state size of Spritz is around n factorial times n, over n to the power 6, which is around 2 to the power uh, 1732. Okay. Uh, at Latin Crypt uh, 2015, uh, some of my previous colleagues did, uh, did uh, this, uh, tackle this problem of uh, state recovery attack on spritz. And they approached the problem using uh, three different approaches. And uh, one of their conclusions was that uh, the simple guess and determine attack, uh, uh, while tackling a cipher like spritz, was actually the best. And, uh, and, the, and the basic guess and determine attack required around 2 to the power 1400 steps. And therefore, uh, RC, uh, the, the spritz appeared to be much more secure than basic RC4, which is kind of expected because the algebraic structure of spritz is a lot more complicated than RC4. Mm, in, this, uh, in, in this presentation, we will concentrate on the case in which uh, the, attack, uh, the, the attacker has uh, access to key streams produced by a single key and multiple IVs. So we'll see that uh, in, in this kind of a scenario, the state recovery attack can be slightly faster. Uh, before uh, we proceed, let me uh, quickly um, uh, go over a definition. So we will call uh, three tup uh, We will call uh, this three tuple uh, S J K a special state if and only if it satisfies simultaneously these three conditions. The first, uh, the first two are basically that all uh, even indexed uh, positions of the S array should hold an odd number. And all odd indexed, and therefore all odd indexed positions of the, of the S array should hold, an even, uh, should hold an even number. And additionally, the values of J and K both need to be even. Now, in the next slide, I will explain why this kind of a definition can be useful. Uh, we, come, the, we now come to the second level. So, so we claim that uh, if going into the squeeze phase, uh, the state is special, then the state after every fourth iteration will, will also be special. And when that happens, uh, the values of uh, the indices i and j kind of have the same parity. So therefore, either they are either both even or both odd. And because this happens, uh, there is no shuffling between the even indices and the odd indices. 
And so the even indices of the array continue to take odd values, and the odd indices will continue to take even values. And furthermore, when this happens, the, the LSB of the keystream bits, of, of the keystream bytes, they kind of form a periodic sequence of period equal to four. Now again, the proof, of proof is not very difficult. Uh, in this table, I've tabulated the modulo two values of all the indices that are, uh, that are updated in one, sh one iteration of spritz. And I've done it over four consecutive uh, spritz iterations. As you can see, the values of i and j are uh, they have the same parity. They're either both even or both odd. And at the end of these four cycles, the values of i, j, k, and z, uh, they, become, they, they become even again. And so this cycle kind of repeats after every four iterations. And when this happens, you can see that uh, the, output, the, the LSB of the output keystream bytes uh, becomes a periodic sequence like of period four. So it repeats this, uh, this, this, this kind of pattern repeats 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on. <coughs> okay. Uh, combinatorially, it's not very difficult to see that, that if you start with a random key or a random key uh, or a key and a random IV, then the probability that uh, going into the squeeze phase we will have a special state is given by this expression for rho that is uh, this, uh, this given expression which for n equal to 256 turns out to be uh, 2 to the power negative of 254 around. So now uh, the attacker, what he tries to do, he, he, he tries to, he looks at the keystream bias and tries to see if he, if he has gotten a special state. Because if he encounters a special state, then the guess and determine approach becomes a lot simpler. Instead of uh, arbitrarily assigning uh, guesses to the cells of the array, he can only assign even values to the odd locations and the odd values to the even locations. And, and, this, and this simplifies the guess and determine approach. So, so what the attacker can do is, is as follows. He can collect keystream bytes for a fixed key and uh, different IVs and uh, inspect the least significant uh, bits of, of the keystream. So if he gets a, gets a periodic sequence like this of period four, he can conclude with reasonably high probability that, uh, that, that the state he, uh, he has is a special state. And if so, he can proceed with the simplified guess and determine algorithm. Otherwise, he can just reject the keystream. And, uh, the, and, th and this being so, he will require around the inverse of row number of IVs for this, for, for this method to work at least once on expectation. So the inverse of row turns out to be 2 to the about 254, and so if the length of the IV is, kept, uh, is specified to be less than 254 bits, this attack kind of does not work. Okay, so I'll give a brief sketch of the guess and determine attack. So, as I said, the, the approach becomes a lot simpler. Uh, the attacker can just uh, assign odd values to even locations and even values to odd locations and then evaluate the correctness of each guess. So he can compute this index D uh, with the values that he has guessed, and then he performs the verification step depending, uh, uh, depending on the value of S of D and the, key stream, the current keystream by ZFR. And we can show that there, there, there are two cases in which he will reach a contradiction, and once he reaches a contradiction, he can just reject the guess and start with a new guess. And if he does not, uh, reach a contradiction at a particular round, he can just go to the next round and do the same step. And he will continue this until uh, his guess, uh, until he reaches a contradiction, or, or, or as it turns out, if the guess is correct, he will not reach a contradiction and uh, he will be able to uh, fill up all the empty locations of the array with the, the actual values of the array at the beginning of the squeeze phase. Okay, so we were able to uh, perform uh, this uh, guess and determine experiments on smaller values of n. And in the paper, we have uh, 
uh, we have outlined a method to estimate uh, theoretically the, the number of guess and determine steps that needs to be performed. And in this graph, we have kind of plotted the, the theoretical upper bounds and uh, the experimentally obtained the average, num average number of steps for uh, values of n between 14 and 20. And for some reason, the theoretical bound was always found to be larger than the experimentally obtained bound. I have no good reason to explain why this is true, uh, why, why this happens. Uh, okay, uh, but, if you, but if you were to uh, follow our theoretical estimates, then uh, by, by extrapolating this formula for n equal to 256, we'll find that uh, when this happens, one should require around 2 to the bar 1247 steps to do the entire guess and determine attack uh, for the full version of splits. I am just in time. Before we conclude, let me just uh, give you a summary of the results that we have obtained. And OK, so now, now I will conclude. Uh, OK, so, so over the past 10, 10 years or so, there have been many attempts to design replacements for the RC4 cipher. And uh, so far, uh, so whatever has been proposed has been broken without exception. So I think it might be still a viable research direction to identify research techniques, to identify design techniques that can, um, that can lead to a cipher that is uh, comparable in speed with RC4 and also secure in some sense. And it is kind of my intuition that uh, more results can emerge for Spritz itself. We can find, we can, maybe we can find a long-term bias. Maybe we can uh, find some collisions in the hash function mode. Or maybe do a more efficient state recovery attack. Again, this is just my intuition. It's not based on any solid research or ideas. OK, so this brings to the end of my talk. So any questions? <laughs>